What is a dark place you've uh, gone in your mind in your life? What, what would be the darkest place you've ever gone for a time, for a moment? Um, and how did you survive? How did you overcome it? That's a, a very good question. I, I would say um, I haven't had as dark moments as many of the people who I care for in the emergency room. I'm fortunate in that way. I've had a pretty, you know, enjoyable, satisfying life. You know, I think everybody um, has dark moments, though, including me. I, one of the most shocking things I feel like becoming an adult, my two big realizations have been, one, no one knows what they're doing, and two, suicide is incredibly common, like in, in all humans and all societies. And that I just find shocking. I mean, I've never seriously contemplated it myself, but I wouldn't say it hasn't crossed my mind during some more stressful um, times of life. Um, I think it crosses everyone's mind. And it, sort of as a kid, I found that I, I never would have guessed how common suicide is. It's an important question to sort of the, uh, the Camus question, like, why live? <laughs> why? Why? Because like life, especially when you're struggling, especially when life is shit. Like, why am I doing any of this? And then on top of that chemistry of your brain, it could be as simple as diet and nutrition and aforementioned exercise and things like this that affect the chemistry such that you're more predisposed to go to the places of asking the question why and maybe um, struggling to find a good answer. Because it's actually a, a question with no good answer, except something in your chemistry says, well, I kind of like it, but there's no good intellectual answer. And especially if day to day it's pain, you, you get to see these stories of um, you know Robin Williams, these people that are on top of the world from an external perspective, but from an internal perspective, it's struggle. Every day is, is pain feels hopeless and um yeah that's a that's a question we all have to struggle with or learn how to ignore maybe because if you ask the question too much you're not gonna you're not going to find a good answer that's a choice you make i personally think you should ask that question a lot um but maybe because i have the luxury of the chemistry i have where i'm not in danger of uh seriously contemplating suicide but why live is an important question to answer constantly and struggle to answer that constantly. But people, I am, uh, I've gotten, uh, I've been extremely fortunate to meet people uh, over the past couple of years that are really struggling. And um, you have probably met people who are really struggling like orders of magnitude more people who are really struggling. Some of it is psychological, a lot of it is biological. And man, life life is a motherfucker. <laughs> it's pretty tough. Very true. I do think also past trauma is a plays a big role there, like we talked about, um, you know, war wounds and PTSD. And a lot of people grew up, I mean, with just horrific childhoods. They were abused in one way or another. And I think a lot of people who have not not a major, I'm not saying a majority, but a lot of people, for instance, who I see in the ER, uh, coming in for threatening suicide or actually trying and failing and being brought to the ER. You know, a lot of them just have really traumatic experiences. Um, you know, saw their parent commit suicide, uh, were abused. You know, these leave scars in the in the human brain and mind, and a lot of the sub their subsequent lives of whether it's substance abuse, alcoholism, et cetera, is almost trying to escape from their own memories. And it's sort of such this overwhelming um, battle sometimes. Like sometimes people get ruined, it seems, and just can't be fixed. You know what I mean? Yes, you can improve diet and health and your life choices and seek out your passion and exercise, and those definitely will help. But sometimes just like, you know, you bear the scars of the past and there's no getting rid of them. Yeah, I think it's possible to live with them. I think so the too. Struggle. I would never say give up. You know, um, but keep fighting. It uh, is a constant. It can be a constant battle for some people. 
I know it can be, and I've talked to uh, many of those folks, I know it can feel hopeless, but keep up the good fight. Hopelessness. Keep up the good fight. Hopelessness is kind of one of the big suicide risk factors that you sort of ask about as a as a doctor. You know, do you feel hopeless? And that sort of uh, can be a harbinger. I have uh, quite a few dark moments. So if you if you if you're listening and you're struggling, we're in this together, brother and sister. Keep up the good fight. Um, Life is a motherfucker, as you said. <laughs> it's it's really harder. I think as a kid, you know, in a joy free childhood, you don't realize like I mean, obviously there's a ton you don't realize about life, but then when you get to be an adult, you realize just how complex and hard it is. Is it this hard for adult animals? I don't know. I don't think it is. <laughs> um, so I haven't seen the honesty of biology before you. Do you think about your own death? Do you contemplate death? Are you afraid of your own death? How do you make sense of it? I've definitely thought about it, especially maybe while doing certain risky things. Um ice climbing and others where every time I looked down, I thought about my own death. But um, I think, you know, I think having kids changes the equation for sure. Um, should change the equation perhaps. So I think a lot of now when I think about what will happen when I die, you know, there's a lot of um, worrying about what will happen to the people I care for. You know, you think about things like insurance policy, life, <laughs> life insurance and, yeah. you know, Yes. disability insurance that's not related to death but more just injuries and ah, that's part of the weight i guess that um you know it, you feel as an adult um that i think grows rapidly when you have kids though though not only you know there's other people you can care for your your own parents and loved ones like a lot of people depend on individuals and so you think about what will happen to the other people when you die but also to push back that weight might be something you've convinced yourself to think about, it's an important way to think about, but you focus on that weight to escape the other weight, which is at one point, this consciousness just comes to an end and it's hard to make sense of, of that. We kind of delude ourselves in thinking, okay, it just, yeah, it ends. That's a natural way of things, and so on. That makes sense. So we're good. Okay, that's the way. Of, that's right. the way of life. But like, I don't think it's like cognitively easy to just realize how terrifying that is. We 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 love life so much that the end of it, it just um, it's something that makes no sense. <laughs> and if you linger on that thought, I think it's a painful, it's a it's a painful, I would say even terrifying thought. Not scared of like, um, in a way that's almost like philosophically terrifying. Like, it just reminds you, maybe humbles you that you don't know any of the, anything about anything. But one of the things we do as humans really well is we, uh, especially with, with kids, you, you realize, okay, we, we start caring for others in the community, in the family and so on, and that distracts us because then we can at least focus on other people's right. problems and not deal with our own. <laughs> uh, when I was a medical student, I was particularly fascinated with kind of what actually happens as people die, like in the last minute, seconds of life. And it's sort of surprising sometimes like what actually kills people, you know, like um, you can get a let's say a bad head injury and um, you know, what kills you? Sometimes it's just your consciousness decreases and you become kind of comatose. You aspirate, your oxygen plummets and you get cardiac arrest. You know, that kind of sequence of events. Or, you know, a heroin overdose, let's say you stop breathing. Similarly, your oxygen goes down, then you get a cardiac arrest. So I was, I was really fascinated with what actually happens, what makes people die. And it was sort of a, a morbid fascination, obviously, like most of med school is. And I had many instances where I've had patients pass. Um, and as a medical student, I was sort of sort of learning what's actually happening, watching it happen, and, you know, not always, always being able to prevent it. And it was sort of a scientific uh, exploration. Then the patient's family comes in and are just devastated. And then it's like, rips you out of the scientific perspective, and you just realize how horrible death is. But the person's fine, you know, it's the family, I guess. And that's why 
Um, it's always, yeah. I guess, that pointed out just how what people leave behind is often kind of the horribleness of death. Like just becoming unconscious and staying that way doesn't seem, I guess, to me personally, so bad. It's sort of like going to sleep, not waking up, not counting the pain and stuff that precedes it. So the actual pain, the actual suffering is often felt by the people who love the person who died. Right. So both financial pain, psychological pain, for years missing them, all those kinds of things. Right, never forgetting the anniversary of their death, you know, just having flashbacks or something reminding you. Um, that sort of brought home to me sort of what death means, and it was more about what people leave behind than what happens to them specifically. See, I like those concerns, because I feel like I can do uh, a lot about those. Those make sense to me. Then just be, if you're a father, just be a good father. Uh, if you're sort of, you mentioned sort of insurance, yeah, there's like financial <laughs> stuff to take care of. What I don't know what to do with <laughs> is is uh, the philosophical existential crisis of the fact that this freaking thing ends. It doesn't, I, I don't know how to deal with the mystery that's beyond death. Why are we here? Why are we born at all? What, what is consciousness? And you just look at yourself. What is this? Why do I have the capacity to suffer? Um, why, why? All these kinds of why questions that don't have answers. Speaking of which, let me ask you a why question. The biggest ridiculous one. What do you think is the meaning of life? Having <sighs> with this book studied the incredible, beautiful biology of life, this the, the components, the engineering components that make up this human body, but when you look at the entirety of it, what, what is, why? Why are we here? Sometimes, probably more often than not, feel like the question of why is a trick of the human brain. And, <laughs> out, and outside of our thoughts, there is no why. Why is not a, something that's in the universe. It's just this trick happening inside our brain. Um, so why, <laughs> why, why is a game that the human brain plays on itself? And then the reality of, life doesn't have whys. Well, I do wonder if asking why is sort of an evolutionary adaptation, like um, why, you know, maybe hunting, gathering, why does this plant grow there and not there? Why do I see the same deer tracks and by the same tree every three days? Why, you know, why is this? Why is that? Um, why does this plant uh, make me vomit and that plant doesn't? I guess those whys are very practical and oriented towards survival. But then obviously, you know, we not only use why, you know, we use it to maybe hunt better, gather better, survive better, but then we sort of extrapolate it into these unanswerable questions, you know, um, about why, like why does life exist? And it's possible that they're not unanswerable in the long arc of science and history. It's we're just striving for the really difficult questions. Right now we're just don't know much about anything, and so we're striving. But there, there's long, so most of human history, you were asking why questions for which we now have very precise answers, including with biology and physics and all those kinds of things. And maybe the why is this cutting edge of science, of the explorer of the curiosity of the human mind. Like man's search for meaning is the sort of, the ultimate driver of the why. And it's almost like it could be an evolutionary adaptation of asking exceptionally hard why questions that will never get answered. <laughs> like, so you should always have, like, it's like a queue. It's a, it's a stack of questions, of why questions, and that thing should never come to the bottom. Should always be striving. And that's, that's useful for humans to come up with better and better ways of survival. And uh, maybe, from in a bigger perspective for the universe to figure out something about itself. And it's just humans, just a useful tool for that. Or life on earth is a useful tool for that. Well, John, this, you're, you're, uh, for pe people who should know you're from Philadelphia. I'm from Philadelphia. So yeah. it's an, it's an honor that you would travel all this way from a place I love to the new place I love. And, uh, that you would write this really incredible book that celebrates the human body in the most honest of ways. And uh, thank you for everything you do, for being a great educator, for being a great doctor, for being a great person, and for spending your really valuable time with me today. Thank you, John. Thanks for having me, Lex.